We all know the release of the NES revitalized the home gaming market, both in Japan and the US. And the big driving force behind this was the revolutionary Super Mario Bros. It arguably invented the genre of 2D platformers, although some people may give that honor to Pitfall. Whether or not it was the first, it was leaps and bounds above anything gamers had seen up until then, literally and figuratively, and it set a whole new standard for action games. Of course, it took some years before other developers could really turn the formula into something substantial of their own making, and other platformers from the mid-80s are... a mix of good and not so good. But eventually, we saw the birth of other iconic side-view platformers like Castlevania in 1986, and the following year, Mega Man. The Mega Man series has now been running for over 30 years and is practically a household name. Some people have complained that Capcom just milked the series for the sake of making a profit. But most gamers who have played the games from start to finish can tell you that each title added fresh gameplay elements and evolved enough to justify continued sequels, even with the limitations of the 8-bit NES. Since video games are a form of artwork and everybody has their own aesthetic perception, of course you can't objectively say that any one title is the best. But when discussions or polls come up about the series, you'll generally find majority opinion is quite consistent. People choose either Mega Man 2 or 3 as their favorite. Strictly speaking, Mega Man 2 has the exact same formula as Mega Man 1. What was it about Mega Man 2 that took it from being a good game and elevated it into becoming a staple of the industry? In this episode, I'd like to offer my theories as to why. Mega Man 2 was released in 1988 in Japan and set a precedent in quality that action games would be judged by from then onward. Like its predecessor, you could select the order you wanted to play the stages in, with each one represented on the stage select screen by the boss waiting for you at the end. This is a staple of the Mega Man series. Each stage is a domain that belongs to one of the robot villains, and the stage theme and structure are a reflection of the boss's element or ability. In order to fight Heat Man, you'll have to get through a stage with lava. Bubble Man's stage mostly takes place underwater, and Metal Man resides in a mechanical factory. After beating a boss, you'll receive a modified version of their weapon, which you can switch to at the pause screen and use whenever you like, as long as your weapon meter doesn't run out. And just like the first game, the key to progressing smoothly is to find each boss's weak point. The bosses will take much more damage per hit if you can figure out which of the other boss's weapons they're weak against. So much so that nowadays, when we play a Mega Man game for the first time, the first thing most people will do is look up an online guide with the boss order. Once you beat all of the initial stages, you're transported to the castle of your arch nemesis, Dr. Wily, where the difficulty ramps up sharply. Getting through all the sections of the castle will prove much more challenging than the previous levels, but again, each boss has a weakness, up to the very final form of Dr. Wily, so knowing which weapon to use is just as important as fast reflexes. Those are the basics, and none of them are drastically different from the first game. So what sets Mega Man 2 apart from Mega Man 1? Most obviously, there are 8 robot bosses to choose from in the beginning, as opposed to 6 in Mega Man 1. Now, adding 2 more levels isn't going to revolutionize the gameplay, but there is another small yet very important difference in the bosses of Mega Man 2. Their names. Bosses in Mega Man 1 had names like Fireman and Iceman. They're as literal as you can get. It was the birth of the series, so you can't blame them. But the bosses in Mega Man 2 have names that relate to their attribute without being too direct, which has a completely different impact. We can surmise that Bubble Man lives underwater, but if he had been called Water Man, it would have been... corny. Similarly, we know Heat Man attacks with fire, but Heat Man sounds way cooler than Fire Man. Crash Man is a bit unclear, but it definitely gives the impression that he's quick and aggressive. And it's just a badass name. Crash Man. I wish I could have had a nickname like that as a kid. The improvement in naming may not affect the gameplay, but it gave the game a more compelling world view. The graphics in the first Mega Man were already excellent by NES standards, and Mega Man 2 doesn't technically have better artwork. What it does have is a lot more variety in stage design, and more appropriate stage graphics in relation to the bosses. Every level is represented as a totally distinct environment. 
Metal Man's stage has a mechanical looking environment with gears and conveyor belts. Wood Man's stage is a forest. Air Man's stage takes place in the sky. The enemies are also mostly stage specific and match the environments, like mechanical rabbits in a forest or fish underwater. This is the area where Mega Man 2 clearly made the greatest leap, building continuity between the gameplay and presentation. Mega Man 1 does try this a couple times. Fireman's stage has lava, and Electman's stage has circuitry. But other levels like Bomb Man and Cut Man are just some place. It isn't that Mega Man 2 perfectly represents every environment, or that Mega Man 1 doesn't try at all, but taken as a whole, Mega Man 2 is much more consistent. And if the environments in Mega Man 2 were more diverse and relevant than the first game, the music was worlds ahead. Every song in Mega Man 2 is a perfect audio complement to the stage it accompanies, and this was a huge part of the experience. The music in Metal Man stage is fast and snappy. It fits perfectly with the animating gears in the background. Bubble Man's music is fluid and melodic, exactly what you would expect for an underwater stage, and Heat Man's music so accurately depicts the feeling of traversing fire and lava that it can actually make you hot. Of course, no one can forget the first time they got to the Wily stages and heard the background song. You knew you were in for the fight of your life. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love the music in Mega Man 1. Elecman's stage theme is an unforgettable masterpiece. But it doesn't remind me of electricity. So what about the actual level design and gameplay? Much like the artwork, every level has a different gameplay gimmick, and I'm pretty sure this is why Mega Man 2 ends up at the top of so many lists. In Flashman's level, the floors are slippery. In Quickman's level, the lights turn off and you have to do some platforming in the dark, not to mention the sections with the sliding bars of death. Going underwater in Bubble Man's stage changes the gravity and lets you jump high, sometimes too high if you don't pay attention to the spikes at the top of the screen. Air Man's stage has you traversing huge robot heads and moving clouds, and Crash Man's stage has you riding platforms that cycle along a track. In 1988, no other game had given gamers anywhere near this much variety, and it was all done so smoothly and briskly that you never even realized how revolutionary it was. In fact, in 1988, few developers probably thought this would have been possible on the NES. The weapons you receive from bosses in Mega Man 2 are also packed with a surprising amount of variety and vastly improved over the first game. The Metal Blade allows you to shoot in 8 directions, making it an invaluable tool for stages with enemies that attack from above or below. The Air Tornado flies diagonally upwards and has a wide enough hit range to act as a shield from unexpected enemies when used properly. Perhaps most original was Flashman's Time Stopper, which would freeze enemies while in use and even deliver damage to a certain boss, who I'll leave unnamed for those who haven't completed the game yet. In addition to weapons, there were three special items to help you traverse levels. A platform that floats in the air, a jet to fly over pits, and a sort of bouncing thing that would climb up walls once connecting with one. These items were sort of a precursor to your dog Rush that appeared in Mega Man 3 and performed similar functions. Once you got to Dr. Wily's castle, all three would be needed to clear certain sections, so they were a central part of gameplay. Now, to be fair, if you were to look at the specific layout of platforms and reflexes demanded of the player, Mega Man 2 is not clearly better than Mega Man 1. But there is one aspect of the game that gave it the universal appeal its predecessor was lacking. The difficulty level. The Mega Man series has been around for over 30 years, and if you're a serious gamer, you've probably played over 10 Mega Man games. We've literally had over three decades to practice, and the formula is technically always the same. We also have the benefit of online guides, YouTube playthroughs, and just more sharing of information among gamers. In 2018, if a person were to play through Mega Man 2 for the first time, it would probably seem a bit too easy. Mega Man 1 would be a more sufficient challenge. It may be hard for people who have never experienced the world without the internet to understand, but at the time, Mega Man 1 was almost prohibitively difficult, and if you didn't know the boss order, nearly impossible. Mega Man 2 was so much more accessible. An elementary school kid had a fighting chance of beating it. And this may very well be one of the reasons it became the legend we now remember so fondly. Is Mega Man 2 perfect? No, definitely not. 
Some of the bosses truly are cheap with unavoidable patterns, Woodman and Airman being the most prominent. One of the bosses in the Wily levels requires you to have Crashman's weapon full and not miss at all. If you screw up once, you just have to die and spend ages killing enemies to refill the weapon again. Things like this that require pure memorization without any pattern learning skills are a blemish on an action game, in my opinion. Thankfully, they're small hiccups in an overall painstakingly made game and come nowhere near ruining the experience. All the elements of game design were well thought out in Mega Man 2. Graphics, music, level design, and originality. But it was how they melded together so well into a fluid, seamless experience that allowed the player to get lost in an alternate universe of robots and adventure. You could have a team of the best developers in the world, with all the money, time, and resources they could ask for, and even then, you won't necessarily come out with a game as good as Mega Man 2. It has something that you can't force into a piece of artwork. Imagination. And in an era where all we had to decide which game to buy was a couple pictures on the back of the box, that was a godsend. So ends my exposition on Mega Man 2. Thanks for checking out the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe. I've got a lot more fun topics in the works, and happy gaming.